Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and Minister Mentor Lee, thank you very much for sharing all those old stories with us. I'm sure a number of us were very touched hearing from, from you in particular. We have about half an hour with Minister Mentor Lee, and it is a rare chance for you all to be able to ask him questions, um, and I encourage you to do so. If indeed you do ask a question, we would like to ask you if you could please state your name and the organization you're with, and then proceed by asking a question, preferably in English, for my sake. <laughs> I'd like to start, Minister Mentor Lee, in picking up with the last part of your speech when you talked about Hong Kong and not really knowing the circumstances because you do not live here. Obviously, you know we have had what we call a changing of the guard with our former chief executive, Tung Chi Hua, resigning. I wanted to ask you whether you thought he was a victim of circumstance or of the times. That's a loaded question. Which I'm sure you can answer very well. First, let me say that I'm a friend of C.H. Dong, have been for many years. Uh, I knew him when he was a shipping executive. I met him before he, after he was appointed to this job, but before he took it over. And I was struck by the seriousness with which he approached the problem. Uh, in retrospect, I think he was too nice a man, uh, not sufficiently young and nimble, he wasn't a street fighter. <laughs> in the Hong Kong situation, with people out in the streets, you want a street fighter. <laughs> and uh, then you can avoid this kind of confrontation. Uh, I think that episode is over. You now have to decide what you're going to make of your future. Uh, you can make the life of the next chief executive as onerous and burdensome by making demands which you know he can't support because uh, there are limits as to what you can do within the one country, two systems. Or you can accept that there are these limits and within those limits, you can thrive and prosper. As indeed, the Chinese leaders have shown that they are not unhelpful. I mean, when I was last year, before all these changes and allowing your company's special permission to operate in China and uh, tourists to come without uh, let or hindrance. Uh, the economy was not as buoyant now. Your property prices have gone up by 40 percent. But please remember that the same tap that was open can be shut. <laughs> if I, I wouldn't like to, I'm not sure it's my job <laughs> to tell the chief executive the next chief executive, how to be a street fighter. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I would like now to ask or invite any one of you uh, to ask a question. Yes, we have a gentleman in the front. Again, if you could kindly state your name and organization, if you would. Uh, Mr. Lee, uh, my name is Lee Bing Ching. Just a second, sir. Is the mic on? Just to double check. Is it on? Okay, fine. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Lee, my name is Lee Bing Ching. I'm not representing my organization, I'm just a local <laughs> Chinese. Uh, Hong Kong uh, used to be a British colony. Uh, now it has returned to China. 
but the transition uh, seems to be not easy. Uh, Mr. C.H. Dong, uh, I think, is not doing his job well, at least. Uh, I think there are still quite a lot of uh, people in Hong Kong uh, who are reluctant to go back to China. Uh, so I believe we need a leader with great uh, political intelligence uh, to uh, do this job. He said that uh, Peking has now uh, chosen a member of civil servant uh, left by the British colony as the new executive leader, uh, exec new ex chief executive for Hong Kong. Uh, but British government do not like people with uh, political idea for civil servant. Can he do his job well? Now that was a loaded question. <laughs> That was a load. Mine wasn't so loaded. Well, uh, I'm walking on eggshells. <laughs> I've known Mr. Donald Chang for many years. Uh, he's a different personality and a different character from C.H. Tong. He's younger. Maybe he will learn some of the tricks. If not, if he, I'm not sure he wants to be a street fighter. <laughs> Let me put it in a simple way. This is a very difficult job. I think it was the Economic Times in Hong Kong who asked me, in 1996 or 1997, before the handover. If I were a Hong Konger, what would I do if, after Hong Kong returns to the mainland? I said then that if Hong Kong offered opportunities for growth, prosperity, business, I would stay. But if it didn't, I would leave. She said, won't you consider politics? I said, no. I said, why not? I said, it is a thankless job. You have a master in China. You have subsidiary masters in Hong Kong. And what Hong Kong was led to believe it, it wanted in the last few years of Chris Patton and after Tiananmen is what the leaders in Beijing cannot give. Beijing has no intention of allowing Hong Kong to be a pace setter or a Trojan horse, or whatever metaphor you wish to choose, to try and change the system in China. Anything you do here in Hong Kong which does not disturb or can become an example of what China should do, that they are prepared to allow. But anything that will encourage or surreptitiously induce people in Shenzhen or Guangzhou and then up the coast to try and say, yes, yes, you know, like the Middle East, we have elections in Iraq, elections in Beirut, uh, elections overthrown in uh, Ukraine, Kyrgyzstan, <laughs> fraudulent elections, President flees. I think <laughs> that is not a likely scenario uh, for Hong Kong. You want peace, you want stability, you want growth, you want to shout your hearts out, uh, but not at the, at the system in, in China, you do so. But if you try to influence the course of events in China, 
by example, since you look, this is a better system, I would think that is not likely to win uh, enthusiastic support. I, I speak on general principles of what I know them uh, to be. And uh, if I were a Hong Konger today, I'd stay and do business. And I think you can do good business. Now I invite another question, and if I could kindly ask you, because of our time constraints, and to allow other people to ask questions, whether you could keep your questions brief. Thank you. The lady um, in the corner. If we could have a ro uh, roaming mic, please. Minister Mantori, thank you very much for your very touching speech. And my name why is Lai Shi. Why is it touching? Touching is because you shared a lot of experiences with us, which we didn't have the opportunity to experience the same thing. And my name is Lai Shi. I work for City Group. I have a question. You have spoken very highly of Mr. Deng Xiaoping, and certainly we believe that he has transformed China that no other, other man has ever done. But if you were in his position, would you have done anything different than what he had done for China? How, how can I answer that question? <laughs> I never, I was born in the wrong time. <laughs> I was born in the wrong place. I never went on the long march with him. <laughs> I never commanded whole armies that crossed the Yangtze River and chased the KMT troops out of China. What can I say? We have another question, the gentleman to my right. Uh, Minister Mentor Lee, I'm Stuart Winchester. I work with Allianz Global Investors. I'm most obliged to hear um, what would be the most difficult decision you had to make in your life. And if you could tell us a little bit how you came to making that decision. I've answered this question so many times. <laughs> uh, briefly, it was the decision to leave Malaysia. We spent so much of our lives, political life, bringing about the merging of Singapore with Malaya. If you don't know the history, Singapore was part of the Strait Settlements, Penang, Malacca, Singapore. They were British colonies. Then the rest of Malaya were nine Malay states. At the end of the war, the British decided that they would have to give up Malaya, but they wanted to keep Singapore. So they put Penang and Malacca into Malaya, formed the Malayan Union, and there were protests by the Malays that didn't want equal citizenship. So they became a Malayan Federation, and Singapore became a colony. We spent uh, many, many years to bring about a reunion of the territories because that was our hinterland. We get our water from Johor. So to cut our ties, even though they promised us water for a hundred years, and to have no hinterland, and at a time in 1965, when there was confrontation from Indonesia, that means we are on our own. How do we survive? But if we had stayed on, the Prime Minister of Malaysia, then a very princely man called Tunku Abdul Rahman, said there will be blood in the streets. Because what we wanted was equal citizenship with special rights for the Malays. What they wanted was a Malay Malaysia. And politics run on communal lines. In other words, Malays form one party, Chinese and Indians form separate parties confined to racial groups. We could not accept that because that means 
perpetual division. So when we left, it was a painful decision because in order to bring about change, we had galvanized Malays, Chinese, Indians, Dayaks, Dusuns, all across Malaysia, and to quit and leave them in a different equation in which they are disadvantaged because with us in, it was 40% Chinese, 40% Malays, 20% others. So you can only win by being multiracial. Cut off Singapore and the Malays become an automatic majority. It was a painful decision. Right or wrong, we had to make it. I cannot say that it was right. I thought there was no choice to avoid bloodshed, so here we are, we made the best of it. But we left a lot of very unhappy people behind, whom we had galvanized. And I bear that burden to this day. Any other questions from the floor? Yes, um, the gentleman again on my right. Minister Menta, uh, on behalf of the people of Hong Kong, thank you for all your good wishes for the six, seven million people of Hong Kong. I'm a medical doctor in private practice. Um, I have no doubt uh, your definition for a leader is correct. Good leaders give people what they want, what they desire. And there's no doubt that you yourself will go down in history as one of the greatest leaders not only just for Singapore, but for the region as well. Um, my question is, on a higher level, we are all now living in a shrinking world. We are citizens of this so-called, quote uh, uh, global village. So leadership for one people, giving one people what they want, sometimes has adverse consequence for other people. So I just want to throw the question of a higher level international leadership or the lack of it in the 21st century. Do our kids, do our younger generation will have a better future uh, uh, when we are talking about lack of leadership in the international levels? It's a very broad and deep question. Uh, there's a group called the Interaction Council, <coughs> which was started by Takeo Fukuda, the former Prime Minister of Japan, his, who's now passed away, and Helmut Schmidt, former Vice Chancellor of Germany. Uh, it comprises of all the people who have been leaders of various countries, and they meet from time to time, at least once a year, to discuss long-term problems and immediate great issues, which people in office with the pressures on them of immediate solutions to immediate problems do not concentrate on. And the items that recur year after year because it's not been attended to, are population growth, the imbalance, declining populations in the developed world, which creates problems for the aged, economies that will not be as dynamic and become more lethargic and stagnant, bursting populations in the less developed world, where disease, hunger, AIDS, rampant, and therefore likely to create huge problems for everybody, because AIDS will spread, as bird flu may also trans trans transform itself and move from human to human. So these are enormous, huge problems. Then there's environmental damage which is being done. Uh, 
the Americans have not signed the Kyoto Protocol. Uh, it's very worrying because the snow caps are melting in, in Antarctica. Polar bears are disappearing. I mean, if you watch from time to time, you get this, not just Discovery Channel, but BBC and it's impinging on the consciousness that something fundamental is happening to our planet, which will change our lives. So if you ask me, uh, energy depletion, if China keeps on growing at this rate, and India follows suit, <laughs> will there be enough oil and gas reserves and if there were, what happens to the atmosphere and further earth warming? What happens to Hong Kong when more coal is burned because there's no gas and oil? I mean, uh, asthma, allergies, life can become extremely burdensome. The world is all interrelated. The greater the pollution, the greater the human, human explosion, the worse the consumption, the worse the pollution. Uh, then you have nuclear proliferation. You can not name any number of them. <laughs> I read them from time to time. Uh, what can we do? Finally, you have to leave it to the leaders of the big countries, the biggest of which, the most powerful of which is the U.S., to set the lead. But the U.S. has said, no Kyoto Protocol, it will damage their growth. So uh, maybe we wait for a candidate, Republican or Democrat, who's more like Al Gore, who believes in the green world. But whether Al Gore as president would be able to bring America along that road and put the price of oil up and all these SUVs have got to go uh, half green and you can't... Well, it's a complicated problem, but one which has dire consequences for everybody. And in fact, the, uh, I, I remember one, one reading one program or one article where uh, Chinese climatologist in Xinjiang said, if it goes on, the ice will melt from the mountains, there'll be flooding for the first few years, and then after that, there'll be drought. And what will happen to Xinjiang and its population? This is a terrifying thought. But at the end of the day, maybe mankind is too clever, but not clever enough to save himself. So we'll become extinct like the dinosaurs. If we could entertain just two more questions for Minister Mentor Lee, the lady in the right in front of me and the gentleman on my left. Last two questions, if we could. I am Mrs. Jenny Lee, born in Hong Kong, went to Hong Kong University, taught English part of the time in America, lived my five, year, five years out of the last 12 years in Singapore. Now, now I'm working for my husband who is sponsoring summer programs for mainland Chinese students to come to Hong Kong to mix with Hong Kong University students plus some US students plus some Singapore students in order to nurture leadership in the young generation. Last year, for instance, we went to Singapore for the last two weeks of our program and we had 14 of the NUS best students with us. Now, I have great respect for your leadership. I'd like to ask you, what are the legacies, bad or good, of leadership that you are living in Singapore with? 
<laughs> I, I think it's best left for history to judge that. Uh, I did my best in the circumstances I was placed in. Uh, it was not a uh, 10 out of 10 performance. Uh, I would say I did not fail, otherwise there wouldn't be a Singapore. But how well I succeeded will depend on how uh, history students reviewing the records will decide whether I missed chances which I should have taken. I don't think when you do a job, you should be too concerned with history. I didn't keep a diary because it will distract me from what has to be done. Uh, some people, or some leaders, keep a diary for the purposes of uh, writing their mem memoirs or having uh, PhD students do research on what they have done. I mean, American presidents, when they retire, have libraries where they put all their papers there and get students to study them. I didn't keep a diary, so when I had time to do my memoirs, I had to assemble a team, collect all the bits and pieces of notes I made, my appointments diaries, which my secretary kept, and piece the story together in retrospect. I would say that in life, you do your best, and if your best is not good enough, Nothing can be done. <laughs> if it's good enough, well, you leave something decent behind. Uh, you're doing a good job trying to foster understanding across races, across cultures. Uh, it's not a new idea. There are many programs, uh, Fulbright scholarships, Marshall Plan scholarships, uh, Rhodes scholarships. At the end of the day, I think the world will have, whether we survive in a multipolar world, which I think will come about, whatever uh, the wish of the Americans to remain a sole superpower, I think it's, they may remain for 50 years, maybe 60 years, but by the end of this century, it will be a multipolar world. Uh, there will be the US, there will be China, There'll be Europe, maybe not a military power, but definitely an economic power and a separate power in foreign policy, because it's quite clear to me that the Europeans are going to be a different uh, center of thinking about what the world should be. Uh, it's the French and the Germans who are setting the pace, but I think more and more the other Europeans will realize that yes, they need the Americans against contingencies in other parts of the world and in case Russia becomes aggressive once again, but it will draw together and even the British over time will find themselves more Europeans than they really want to be. And there'll be India, and if you believe the uh, economists, that's Brazil and a few other countries. So it would be a very different world. And if, if they produce a kind of leaders who understand that you need a, 
accommodation in this kind of an interrelated, interlocked world, then maybe institutions may evolve to allow this kind of coordination and cooperation. I was interested to read uh, a report from our mission in Beijing. Uh, I'm supposed to go to a forum in Po Ao later this month, or later next month. This is March, in April, uh, to talk about the kind of future China sees for itself. And it's been carefully thought through, a very well-crafted, well-thought-out series of concepts which shows that they want peace, which shows that they want 40, 50, if not more years of quiet to develop. And the points in Chinese style, uh, they put it as three, two, one. Three are the three big problems China faces. Uh, uh, environmental problems, energy depletion, population and growth. Two, how they have to be different from other countries that grew as major powers. For instance, Germany or Japan, which in order to grow, needing resources, developed empires or developed spheres of influence to reach out to resources. So China has decided it must have a policy where she cooperates with the people who have the resources and trade and acquires those resources in a cooperative relationship. So she's buying up companies in Brazil, Argentina, even Australia, mines, and so on. Uh, it's well crafted and well thought through. In other words, they understand that if they embark on the same policies which previous great powers have taken, there will be conflict and they may never arrive. So I take that as an optimistic sign of what they want. But whether that is what they can achieve is a different matter. Because this generation that does this thinking and is imbued with these thoughts is a generation that went through revolution. There are men in this. 70s, went through the Cultural Revolution, <coughs> paid bitterly for all the mistakes they have made, and know that to transform China, it is a task for generations, not a task for 10, 20 years, uh, to educate the people to get the Western provinces and the Northwest up to the same levels as the coastal provinces, or at least less of a disparity, uh, will be immensely difficult. And that they are not going to go back to either Han China or Tang China, where they were the sole power, as far as they were concerned, the known world, they dominated. They were the only world. Yes, Rome existed at the time that Tang existed or, 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 or Han existed, but they were not in conflict. But they know now that they live in this very interrelated world of instant communications and swift transportation. 
So I will take it as a, a hopeful sign that there is deep thinking at the top and a desire to find a peaceful way for themselves to grow. But whether that will be achieved, I don't know. Mr. Mentor Lee, we just have one last question, if you would. The gentleman I promised uh, on the left, if you could make it as quick as possible, because we're already overrunning. Yes, my name is Alex, Alex Young, and I'm a street fighter helping my family to uh, looking for investment opportunity outside Hong Kong. Uh, so actually, the uh, chief executive of Macau has just did only one good thing, is to liberalize the uh, monopoly business uh, in casino. So I would like to know whether your new direction about the casino business uh, uh, in Singapore in order to uh, push the economy ahead. Thank you. I wasn't allowed to ask that question. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is, a, this is a judgment call for a younger generation of leaders to make. It's a different Singapore from the one that I govern. Uh, I am dead set against gambling. I don't believe you get rich by gambling. Uh, the only kind of gamble I've e I ever indulged in was during the war when I was a, a stretcher bearer for the medical auxiliary services. So at night when we had to stand by air raids and so on, as fellow students at Raffles College, we would play poker. But that's not a game of chance, that's a game of psychology. I don't like games of chance. And I watched the Japanese allow gambling farms during the occupation. I don't know, if they must have had it in Hong Kong too. It was a good way to keep the people, especially the Chinese who are very fond of gambling, keep them occupied. So there are different forms of gambles. And one particularly popular one was to count by four, fantan. So you have a beautiful long stick bamboo, and you've got a croupier who puts a bundle of beads, and he goes four, four, four. And you guess whether the last remains is one, two, three, or four. I watched it, fascinated the skill, the excitement. I never punted. Because I was a mathematics major. <laughs> so I knew the law of chances. If you put the same money on one, two, three, four, you will not get your money back. <laughs> so it's a max game. The banker must win. You put one dollar on each, you win, you get 350. He's taken 50 cents. So win or lose, he wins. You have lost. But we now live in a porous world. <laughs> I've got cruise ships that come in every, every day. And many of them sail nowhere. They just sail outside territorial waters. And in fact, one of our entrepreneurs ran such a cruise ship. And he told his friend who told me, he says, it's a Max game. He wants to have the casino on land. He says, the ship goes out for three days. The man loses his money in one day. After that, you're feeding him the next two days for nothing. <laughs> so, less of the casino on land, he loses his money, he goes home to eat. <laughs> now, if he's going to lose his money on board the ship, or he goes to Batam, which is about half an hour by ferry, or he goes to Kenteng in Kuala Lumpur, which is about 30 minutes by air and another half an hour, well, why not have one in Singapore? 
And we've got uh, really marvelous uh, <laughs> integrated resource like Las Vegas, where according to the proposals, the casino is only a very small part of it. <laughs> no more than 30 to 40 percent. The rest is conventions, hotels, uh, theme parks, water parks, all sorts of beautiful things. I mean, you have Hara, you have uh, uh, Sands, you have Wynn. Well, they are big players. I mean, it's, uh, it's on the Dow Jones SEC quoted. Uh, Singaporeans uh, divided into two groups. The older generation are like me. I, I sat down one, at one dinner over the Chinese New Year and they were all my age or about my age. And I went down the table. They all opposed, except one. And that one ran a casino <laughs> in Queensland. But the young have said, no, no great deal. So what? So the man who ran a casino told me, he says, I said, I read somewhere that in Australia, after they had casinos, there were more suicides. He says, yes, that's only the first few years. <laughs> After that, it levels off. People know you can't win, and you've got all kinds of support groups that tell us. You may, there are people who have got this kind of gene, like an alcoholic has a, a special gene, where you, once you start drinking, you can't stop you. The gene gets stimulated. So similarly, the thrill of win or lose in a few minutes, in a few seconds, gives an enormous surge. Well, if you've got that gene <laughs> and you lose money, that's too bad. So, so the, my colleagues have thought of a very effective way to ring fence. They use the word ring fence. So if you decide that your family member is likely to have that gene, you can apply and he will be barred from the casino. So he's saved. But that doesn't stop him from going on the cruise ship or going to Batam or going to Macau or going to Kuala Lumpur. It's a tough call, but uh, as I've said, leaders are for certain times in certain places. My job is that of a mentor. I'm not the Prime Minister. <laughs> My son is. He's made me a mentor just to remind everybody that I'm not in charge. <laughs> Short one. I've just been asked to take one question, and Minister Mentor Lee has agreed for a very quick one question from our very patient media this afternoon. So if you could quickly have a representative who would like to ask. Yes, the gentleman at the back. If there is a mic. One very quick question. Uh, Mr. Lee, how, um, do you feel that... Um, who, who, what do you represent? Sorry. I'm Tohan Shi from the South China Morning Post. Yes. Um, do you feel that Singapore industry is losing its competitiveness given that Hong Kong businesses employ 10 million workers in Guangdong province to set up the factory of the world, churning out three quarters of the world's microwave ovens and shoes and toys, you know? Well, I was asked that question once by one of your secretaries several years ago. We were having lunch here. Uh, we had a different consul general, so it must be about five, six years ago. And he posed the same question to me. Why are you still in manufacturing? My answer to him is very simple. First, if I were in Hong Kong, I would do exactly 
as what you are doing. Because it doesn't make sense when you can get a widget produced in Zhuhai or uh, Shenzhen or Zhongshan for one third the price. And you can control your operations from here and go down once a week or every other day as you like. And in any case, if you don't do that, they are going to do that and you will be undercut. But the result is you have, depending only on services, you have volatility in your, un in your employment. So whenever you have a downturn, whether you have SARS or whatever it is in your tourist trade and other services go down, you are landed with an unemployment problem. We decided to keep 25% of our GDP in manufacturing. And we believe we can keep on upgrading and the lower end can move out to Batam, to Malaysia, to Thailand, to the Philippines, to Bangladesh, and we keep on moving up. Value add, we do. Testing, we do. They go out, our supervisors go out, our managers go out. The day my neighbors can educate their people to as high a level as we are educated and skilled, that day we'll have to change policy. But I think we are 10, 15, maybe more years, and we are educated in English, they're educated in, in Bahasa Malaysia or Bahasa Indonesia or Thai or whatever. So we have a certain uh, edge that gives our workers, our managers, our accountants, uh, that value add. That stabilizes the unemployment. So we never had the kind of unemployment when you were, you were, as you had in Hong Kong when your economy turned down. I think you went up to about eight, nine percent. Ours reached five percent at its worst with SARS. And we've gone back to three percent because we've got this ballast. Manufacturing occupies a steady stream. Yes, you have ups and downs with IT, but uh, you can take the cycles as they come and go. We've got IT, we've got uh, pharmaceuticals, we've got petrochemicals. We think we can stay in the business. But my successors have got to keep on relooking the problem, revisit the issue, watch the competition, see how good the upgrading of education and skills are in our environment, in our surroundings, and how far ahead we can remain. Thank you. Minister Mentoli. <laughs> Minister Mentoli, on behalf of Citibank and everybody here today, thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you.